We all remember the era of industry plants blatantly stealing authentic artist style and persona to try and make it in the music industry. But fast forward to today and where many of them are now is quite shocking. Some are horrendously down bad, while others have become superstars. Leading to the question, where are these industry plants now and what happened to them? I'm Rashad Fashir and this is Industry Plants, Where Are They Now? Part 1. But before we talk about each industry plant, we have to define the term. And here's what my friend Matty Balls came up with. Industry plants are artists who sign early in their careers and have their image mostly created by the label as some sort of marketing gimmick, which includes faking that they're an independent artist. Or in other words, to the average music fan, a fraud. The first industry plant on this list is the infamous Baby Goth. And before talking about where she's today, we have to look at her career. Baby Goth was a woman who randomly just appeared on the SoundCloud rap scene. And I mean randomly. Her first moment in the public rap spotlight was when she appeared on Trippy Red's album as a feature. Then her first song dropped, Swimming, featuring Lil Xan and Trippy Red. For any other emo rap artist, this would be great. However, no one knew who Baby Goth was. So it was clear she was an industry plant. Because how was your first ever song on Trippy Red's album? But at the time, being an industry plant was a relatively new concept. So as crazy as it sounds, it wasn't obvious to all the fans. However, this would all change soon, when fans would start to notice some pretty fishy details. Specifically one fan named Progress, who found a lot of red flags. For starters, he noticed that despite having so many mainstream features, Baby Goth had very inconsistent social media followings. She only has one song and that's actually featuring Lil Xan and Trippy Red, and also that she featured on Trippy's album before her song even came out, should set off a fuck ton of red flags. She had 200 followers on Twitter, and her SoundCloud had 1,000 followers, but on Instagram she had 160,000 followers, especially since she only had one song, right? Well, Progress and the other fans were correct, because what Baby Goth was showing the world wasn't the whole truth, not even a lick of it. It turned out that Baby Goth had an entire past that only she and her label knew about at the time that they were trying to cover up. How was this exposed? Well, the YouTuber Progress found that Baby Goth had edited out a name of an old song of hers in an Instagram post. I also found it weird that since taking that screenshot, she has now edited out that she ever had a different song in that caption. And so that made me go a little bit like, hmm. He did some digging and what he found was quite shocking. Baby Goth was not always Baby Goth. In fact, for most of her life, she was a singer named Bria Bueno, who turned out had a ton of songs. Except it was her in the years prior, where she had dressed like a princess, the music was completely different, and most importantly, she was getting no place. It was obvious she wasn't blowing up from that old music and wasn't a SoundCloud rapper like she claimed. She definitely wasn't big enough for a record company to sign her. In fact, it turned out she was raising money on a GoFundMe as site to raise money for her music career, saying, please make my dreams come true, explaining she needed money for production for the EP, travel expenses, and hotel accommodation, for her husband and son. Yep, you heard me right. She has a husband and son. However, she didn't raise enough money, falling short by $10,000, and likely had to give up on her previous dreams of making it by being true to herself, which is pretty sad in my opinion. And it was clear from this that Baby Goth was told to cover up her past, and then create an image where she would show face tattoos, guts, and be edgy slash emo. So that's who she actually was. But if it wasn't how she actually got to fund her music career, what was it? Because just getting some face tats doesn't fund your career, it doesn't get you random cosigns from large SoundCloud rappers, and it definitely doesn't get you signed. Well, in an interview with No Jumper, Baby Goth did reveal some more facts, although very muddy, about how she did get her start in the industry. So, mm. I mean, for a while I was just like building my following up on Instagram, mm -hmm. so it would be like ready when I release music. And then I was just doing like covers. Hitway found me on the Explore page and then flew me out. Explain who Hitway is for the people at home. Um, they're my production. But it just didn't make that much sense. She explained that she was doing covers and got flown out by her label. She then said they told her she reminded them of Trippy Red, which doesn't really resemble her at all in any way. I mean, look at her. But Adam 22 also asked her about her industry connections because how do you just get a Trippy Red and Lil Xan feature? Keep in mind, Lil Xan was very big at the time. So she explained that her and Trippy had the same audio engineer. So, okay, so me and Trippy have the same audio engineer. And her manager just knew Zan. So it's safe to say this did not clear the air at all. However, the recording group who got her signed and management did, even if it was by accident. You see, after the YouTuber Progress made a video on Baby Goth, they falsely striked the YouTuber Progress's video and started threatening him, which I won't go into here. However, they did agree to some calls, where we learned some pretty shocking information First, they admitted that they had intentionally covered up Baby Got's past. And because of that, the label was upset that I let that out. She does have kids, it's obviously, obviously, he 
people know that. Um, but the late, like, she signed her public, and they didn't want that to be public because that can hurt, like, people's view of her for some reason. I don't really understand why, but um, it can hurt people's view of her. So we were waiting until after she dropped her movie, which is next month, um, to come out with that. Um, so it was just like, it messed up timing of a lot of stuff and like the label, like um, Republic is super mad about it. So they're trying to make us take it down. This was cool, but it was more of an admission of guilt. What came next was pretty shocking. The first thing the manager said was that Baby Goth had absolutely no personality. So he had to come up with a fictitious persona himself. And although I think he did a pretty bad job, it definitely worked. And this was his reasoning. I made Baby Goth, right? All right. That's the real, that's the real story, right? At the end of the day, a lot of these artists are not what you think they are, right? You know, Baby God talks about all this cool stuff and women's rights and all that shit. That bitch did nothing like that, right? First thing I did, because I know that bitch, bitch is like a potato. She has no personality. So I was like, since a girl, since a person can't speak, you gotta make them look cool, right? So we get a cool name, right? She not goth, but the goth wave is popping. So he's like, fuck it. Let's cool. Was, was do the God thing, you know what I mean? Yeah, and she talks like a baby, so I put baby God together, right? So that's how I came up with the name at the end of the day, right? And then what we did was, it was easy. All we had to do, we get face tats, because all these artists got face tats, right? So you build a aesthetic, you build a brand, right? So when she walks into the office, she looks cool, you know what I mean? That's, that's all labels want. And in the end, he admitted Baby God's music was trash. But that wasn't the point. He just wanted to finesse the label. And if we're being honest, he did. So props to this guy. This was very interesting as it was an inside view on what went on behind these management's heads and the thought processes. With Baby Goth, it was frightening. It was clear she was just a lick to this guy. He had no interest in ever helping her career, but rather to collect a percentage of a record deal, use the rest to promote her career, and when the money ran out, have her kick rocks. If you'd like to know the full details, go watch the full video by Progress. I mean, this guy pulled up her marriage documents, did a call with her management, and fact-checked every minute detail she lied about. He didn't just catch her in 4K, he caught her in like 40K, it was insane. I do believe he went too far though, at some point you just have to let it rest. But this was just the half of it. What happened afterward to Baby Goth was even worse. After this debauchery of her being exposed, she was still connected with Wiz Khalifa, she got a genius video, she dropped a song with Slim Jimmy, but it was all too late. To fans, Baby Goth was a fraud. And worse, everyone started agreeing her music was trash. Later, she would post screenshots as a cry for help, basically admitting she was depressed. And it was clearly because her music career had not gone the way she thought it would, which I can't help but feel bad for. But that was still in 2019. What happened after that? From 2020 and beyond, Baby Goth just fell off of a cliff. She didn't post at all. However, in 2022, she did return with an announcement saying, after two years, I'm finally dropping. Thank you to everyone who stuck with me throughout my absence. I've gone through so much. And it seemed like she actually was going to drop music. Because in another post, she wrote, Run up the comments, show my label how y'all are ready for this music. Swipe to hear a moment from one of my new songs. Unfortunately, no music ever came. And after that, it was pretty clear what had happened. It seems like after the catastrophe of a career she had, post-2019, Baby Goth was shelled by her label. What does that mean? Well, it's a fate worse than being dropped by a label. Being shelved by a label means they know they will never get their return on their investment. However, they want to be sure of that and don't want to let the artists they signed go free and become successful, even if there's a small chance. So they shelve the artists and let them rot. That's what happened to Baby Goth. But wait, it somehow got even worse. In 2022, her YouTube channel was hacked and her label didn't even care enough to get it back. That same year, she tried to assure her fans new music would drop once again, writing, Please bear with me while my amazing team gets my YouTube channel unhacked. Mad Together music video is ready and waiting for you. Debut album coming this year. Still no music. And later on, it became clear her label had been the ones who quote unquote hacked Baby God's page. They had essentially repurposed it for their other artists. It was obvious the label was actually trying to cover up her career because it looked bad. So much so that her music video with Trippy Red, Swimming, was deleted. And if 2022 couldn't get any worse, at the end of the year, she got into a car accident. And after all of that, she went on a two-year hiatus again. And at that point, can you even blame her? But it's 2024 right now. What is she doing currently? Well, you may or may not be pleased to know she is really active right now. Except not in the way you think. In 2024, she's been posting multiple times per week since the beginning of the year. However, it's not to promote her music, but her new exclusive content. Wink wink, cough cough, if you catch my drift. Which is pretty sad. It's a classic case of what happens to naive people 
who think they can make it into showbiz just to have to turn to some pretty disgusting things to make their ends meet. And if you're curious, just check out her Instagram and you'll see what I mean. Overall, Baby Goth has one of the saddest industry plan stories ever. It's a lesson to everyone, and her story shows that being disingenuous is literally one of the worst things that you can do to your career, no matter what you're in. However, this isn't always the case, because this next artist was just as much, if not more, disingenuous than Baby Goth. However, their results were much different. And that is the Killer Roy. But before we talk about where he is today, how was he exposed as an industry plan? Let me take you back to 2019, where most fans of rap, including myself, discovered the Kid Leroy through his lyrical lemonade song called Let Her Go, which got millions of views on YouTube, followed by his song with Lil Tecca, Diva, that would also get millions of views. If you listen to the music, it was clear the Kid Leroy was going to be another one of those artists who got a lyrical lemonade video to blow up. I mean, he was even featured on songs with some, like Tecca. At the time, the Kid Leroy was a teenage rapper who's working with artists like Lil Skies and had connections to Juice World, but it didn't take long for fans to find some other details. At first, it wasn't that much. Fans found that Leroy was signed under Columbia Records and Lil Bibby, who Juice World was also signed to, they figured Bibby had made some calls and got Leroy a video on Lyrical Lemonade, as Cole Bennett listened to Lil Bibby growing up, and that's honestly how Juice World got his music videos. So to be honest, it wasn't really a big deal. And after fans found more interviews of Bibby, it was clear that was what happened. This Australian kid I'm very excited about, I think. How do you end up with an Australian kid? Um, I heard his music, and that shit just blew me away. I've been trying to sign it for a whole year. <laughs> Everybody was on it, but we got it, and now we got to put a plan. So end of story, closed case, right? Nope, because one fact wouldn't slip past a very diligent fan, a man named Hello Yassin, who despite the story, said something about a teenager from Australia reaching Lil Bibby was very fishy, very, very fishy. On top of that, prior to signing to Lil Bibby, Leroy had an EP called 14 with a Dream, which was made with high quality equipment, good producers, and great mixing. So Yassin thought, how did the kid Leroy go from being a nobody to having all these people produce for him and get signed? There's something missing in the middle of the story. Leroy had also repeatedly claimed he was dirt poor, so that wasn't adding up either. But there wasn't anything to confirm Yassin's suspicions, so he just kept his eyes peeled. And eventually, he found something. It was a short clip from a No Jumper interview that Leroy had quickly brushed past. Most fans thought nothing of it, and it was a question about Leroy's origin. I posted a video and this guy um, locally in Sydney was like, oh, I have a studio, come through, like, you know, you can use it for free whenever you want. Like, you know, we got producers here, da 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 da. Yassine realized this was key, and the fact that Leroy brushed past it so fast only furthered his suspicions. He didn't buy the fact that teenage Leroy was making all his music himself, because behind every young musician, there's always an older figure who built them as a talent and taught them the game. Think Chief Keef and DJ Ken, or any other younger rapper. This prompted Yassine to go digging and go down an insane rabbit hole. And what he found was probably the craziest information he could have found. And will definitely go down as one of the greatest rap exposés in the past five years, or even 10 years. So what was it? Yassine found that Leroy had been taken under the wing of a guy named Marcus at a young age. Marcus would throw parties, DJ, produce, and he met the kid Leroy in 2015. Now bear with me because things are about to get very interesting. Leroy messaged Marcus at first, but he was ignored. So he used a girl to message Marcus and get Marcus's attention, which Yassine later showed was one of Leroy's go-to strategies for getting his foot in the door. This also proved he lied in the No Jumper interview because he hadn't posted a video and got discovered. He had to message Marcus multiple times and even finesse him to get a chance. But after finally linking up, Marcus allowed Leroy to perform. Marcus realized Leroy was talented and saw a lot of potential in him and decided he would take Leroy under his wing. From then on, Leroy and Marcus became best friends. He called Leroy his artist and every weekend Leroy would come to Marcus's house and record music with him. He'd eat, sleep, and record there. But that wasn't all. Marcus also single-handedly was responsible for shaping Leroy's sound. At the time, Leroy only knew how to rap and wanted to rap. However, Marcus realized that rap music was changing and it wasn't going towards lyrical rap, but a more melodic style of rap. So as the big brother figure he was, he taught Leroy how to use autotune and make melodic music so he could succeed. Leroy was very against it, but he tried it out and it was a huge success. Marcus was even going as far to write music for Leroy. At that point, he was so invested that he had taken a year off after high school solely to develop Leroy. On top of that, he changed his Instagram name from his DJ name to their group name. And Leroy also wasn't okay with the idea of Marcus rapping with others. So Marcus only worked with Leroy. It was safe to say 
Marcus had put all his chips in and was willing to put it all on the line for Leroy's career. And in 2016, it looked like this was all about to pay off. That year, a man named DJ Ziggy gave Leroy and Marcus an opportunity to perform at a radio show in Sydney, one of Australia's major cities, where they not only performed, but also met a Sony label executive. DJ Ziggy was a DJ, of course, and a manager as well. And you see, did later find that Ziggy did manage Leroy for a short period of time, however unknown when. So after the meetings they had with Sony, which seemed very promising, Marcus had to go back to his family. Remember, he took a year off after high school just to develop Leroy, so he had to explain to his family that things were finally going to work out. Marcus thought that Leroy was going to go back home with them. However, Leroy's mother explained they were going to stay for a bit longer. Marcus then asked her how they were going to put music out as a duo, and she said, don't worry about it. She would just record the vocals and send them to Marcus. Okay, great. So Marcus thought it was all good and left. Two months passed, Marcus didn't hear from them. Did Leroy stop recording music? Probably not. So what happened? At some point in Sydney, the Sony executives took Leroy aside and told him he didn't need Marcus. He was the star, he was the talent, and he should ditch Marcus and become a solo act. Of course, his mother agreed. After all, Sony had better producers, engineers, better everything, period. Marcus couldn't even come close. So why not just cut him out of the picture altogether? Why split the fame, money, and all your success with someone who wasn't essential? I mean, all he did was be one of the sole reasons you're even in this position in the first place, right? It's not a big deal. And I guess you can't really blame Leroy and his mother. They were in a very interesting position, but the lack of loyalty is pretty messed up. They couldn't even make him Leroy's DJ. So Leroy had just used Marcus as a stepping stone and left him behind. With his new people at Sony, Leroy recorded his 14 with a Dream EP, which became the initial project to get him the attention of Lil Baby. By the way, he did Sony too once he got introduced to Lil Baby which I just thought was kind of funny. But what's even worse is they didn't tell Marcus any of this. They just sold Marcus the dream and lied that he was going to be a part of everything. Six months went by and Marcus heard nothing from them. While Leroy was recording music every day, Marcus was praying that he would hear back a reply from Leroy and his mom. He got nothing. At the time, he still thought they were a group act. So one day, he had enough and decided to rap himself and put out a solo song. And that's when he finally got a response. Leroy's mother hit him up and was furious, commanding him to take down the song and video because Leroy wasn't in it. And now that he had done what he had just done, he had to take down everything on the group's page or their lawyers were going to force him to. And although she had no legal grounds to do something like this, Marcus was scared and obliged. And that's how all of this got erased from the internet. At this point, Leroy was already signed and him and his mother were getting money from Sony. So Marcus was no longer needed. Ziggy was the new Marcus. And Leroy decided he would just lie that he had done everything himself until then. But to be fair, Leroy was just a kid who was acting in his best interest. Um, that was literally my goal for like the last two or three years was just I want to get a video with Cole, I want to get a video with Cole, so. So this was some pretty crazy information. It proved that Leroy had faked his origin story and basically lied to everyone. However, it wasn't everything. And I guess Leroy and his team realized they already looked really, really, really bad. So they had to put a stop to it before things really got out of hand. Their plan of action was to do the same thing they had done to Marcus, but to Yasin. Erase him from the internet. Days after Yasin's video had been posted and got a decent amount of traction, Leroy's label issued a copyright strike taking down Yasin's video forcefully, and it was falsely issued. Afterwards, Leroy's main producer at the time, Han, was sent to scare Yasin. Han threatened Yasin, first by saying, lol, he doesn't care about it. I care though. You're putting out false information with no real evidence. He then told Yasin to be careful. It's cool if you want to keep deleting my comments, but be careful what you say on future videos because there's a difference between discussing opinions and trying to slander someone's name for some clicks. And it's safe to say the industry plant, police force, aka Hello You Seen and Progress were not scared one bit because they just went even harder. Years later, this is also pretty funny because Han and the Kid Leroy fell out after the Kid Leroy dropped Lil Baby as a manager. So I wonder what he thinks today. And taking down Yasin's video turned out to be a huge blunder. It totally backfired because not only did Yasin now go much harder, fans would start to turn their backs on Leroy in numbers. Now I was finding deal, out yeah. about everything, it just seemed like industry planish. So Yasin went back to digging and when he came out, he had the entire story of how Leroy became an industry plant. This time, he found a lot about Leroy's family background. Remember when I said Leroy was supposedly poor? Well, I guess this was emphasized too much and Yasin realized something was up as they had even filmed a no jumper vlog where Leroy would supposedly show off his hood except when you look at the comments they're all clowning them first off Yasin found out that the kid Leroy's mother used to manage Scott Kane who was pretty big back in the day she also seemed to be a big fan of the Kardashians and idolized Kris Jenner which explained why she was so on board with the Leroy going all in on his music career 
he found a lot more about her, but I'm going to leave it at that key info, just enough for you to get the story, out of respect for Leroy and his mother. However, what I just told you about his mother doesn't prove Leroy was rich, right? Just that his mother had big industry connections. But everyone doesn't just have a mother, they also have a father. And something about Leroy Yassine found was that he would never mention his father. Why? What about him? Do they not have a relationship? Well, it was because his father was the definition of someone massive in the music industry. His father had worked with Jay-Z, Nelly, Fat Joe, and more. If you don't know, those are some of the biggest rappers from the 2000s. And his father was definitely a very wealthy man. But hey, maybe his father wasn't in Leroy's life, right? Nope. Leroy was very close to his father, and he went to a private Catholic school definitely paid for by his father. Yassine even found out that Leroy's dad owned a boat. On top of that, Leroy's father was constantly sharing posts showing love to Leroy. And the kid Leroy could play guitar. Who taught him? His father. But to be honest, his father just wanted the best for his child. He was probably on board with the idea of not being mentioned for the sake of Leroy's career, understanding how crucial the rags to riches story was in Leroy's blow up. So, where is the kid Leroy now? Well, after getting signed to Bibi, Leroy was touted as Juice World's protege, and after his passing, the second coming of Juice. The thing is, it didn't work that well. Sure, the kid Leroy has become huge today, but while he was pursuing the emo rap track, Juice World fans hated him with a passion. The reason? Because it was blatantly obvious that the kid Leroy was an industry plan and that Juice World's ex label and management were attempting to turn him into another cash cow just like Juice World. The Juice World fans really hated him, openly admitting to it, saying things like, just don't like how they're pushing out of him, he's not all that. And I think his music is alright, like he just isn't on Juice's level and shouldn't be on songs with Juice, I think he ruins them. However, afterwards, Leroy ditched Lil Baby in grade A, likely over how large of a cut they take from their artists. Then, Leroy became managed by Scooter Braun, who famously manages Justin Bieber and Ariana Grande, dropped a single stay featuring Justin Bieber, went number one on Billboard, went number three on Billboard with Miley Cyrus, and was also nominated for not one, not two, not three, but 60 music awards, two of which being the Grammys and one about 16, and he's only 20 years old. So it's safe to say the Kid Leroy is not a failed industry. He's a successful superstar who's managed to come out on top and it really shows you how tough it really is to make it in the music industry as his story isn't fully over either. However, this sort of picture perfect story doesn't always happen. In fact, it usually doesn't. And there's no clearer case than the next rapper on this list, Jumex, who at one point was the poster child for industry plants. And where he is today is pretty sad. But of course, before we speak about his current situation, how did he even get exposed as an industry plant in the first place? Jumex started blowing up in 2019 after his hit song Loner. And when one song randomly started blowing up out of nowhere, it was very apparent something fishy was going on behind the scenes. So once again, Progress, the same YouTuber that exposed Baby Goth, came out to expose him too. And he showed that Jumex not only had 100 subscribers and just randomly got hundreds of thousands of views, which after watching the video and, you know, hearing the song, obviously it didn't happen organically. If you look back on Jumex's actual stats that came from last year as provided by Social Blade, you'll be able to see that he didn't really have any subscriber growth or even that many views that got accumulated in the span of from like the past March or whatever it ends up being. Um, it shows that he had roughly a hundred subscribers gained in the entire like last nine months um, Up until before the music video had dropped He then showed that the way the views were being processed was not normal One point was actually getting less than 700 views on its worst day Then the most noticeably weird section is right here where it shows that his video was getting less and less views for about four days Straight going all the way down to only 31k in a day to then boom out of nowhere, 102,000 views the next day. It was clear Jumex was viewbotting. Now there's two things that could obviously be able to make him get that many views. One being that he got promoted, which is confirmed, but in a way that's a little bit different that I'll go into more detail later. And then there's also the possibility of subbotting or viewbotting. We may not have full evidence, obviously, of him viewbotting on the YouTube video, although it's pretty compelling when his views were massively skyrocketing rocketing then dropping really low progress then proved that jumex's soundcloud statistics were literally impossible this is what the like and repost count should look like can look at right here you can see that his song trapped had 3.2 million plays which is an insane number but what's wrong with that well just look at the interactions less than 10,000 likes and less than 700 reposts what but that wasn't all 
Progress also looked into the music video for Loner. There were three executive directors, a whole set team, which takes tens of thousands of dollars. Later, he was given a DJ Snake cosign, who by the way is one of the biggest DJs in the world. Why would DJ Snake mess with a randomo rapper that's supposed to be unknown? One of the people Jumex got shouted out by was DJ Snake one of the biggest producers in the entire world. How the fuck does DJ Snake know who Jumex is? So after all of this, it was pretty clear he was an industry plant. I mean, all you really had to do was look at his music. His song Loner was a cookie cutter scream rap song where he starts yelling in an emotional voice. He essentially said, this was popular, let me copy that. But something I didn't mention earlier was the music video was directed by ex Odd Feature member Taco, who was pretty up there in the music industry. And it was released by a record label. So how did Jumex get there? What was the explanation for that? Well, Progress found that out as well. Jumex's old music was just Walmart Lil Peep and XXXTentacion music. And he also did rebrand his name from being Lil Jumex to Jumex. But in high school, he went viral while smoking in class and yelling world star. This would catch the attention of a man named Brad Scoffer. Who was he? While well, Brad was Tyler the Creator's old tour manager and the operating manager of Golf, Tyler the Creator's clothing brand, he also works at Cam Flogna and he's pretty high up there. So I guess it wasn't a coincidence that Trapped by Jumex was being played at Cam Flogna, which is Tyler the Creator and Odd Features yearly festival. So Brad had watched Jumex's famous world star video, decided to invest in him, and hooked him up with a bunch of industry connections, and even created a fake indie label to sign Jumex under. I guess Brad thought he was a genius or something. And later on, this was confirmed when someone close to Brad explained that Brad was overconfident and he thought making Jumex a large artist was light work. Matt Mark Jumex because he saw the smoking video and, you know, he, Brad is like a 40 year old white guy, you know, but he thinks he knows what's cool and rap, what's popping, you know, you know, he's really out of touch. And he saw the, the video of Jumex smoking and, you know, thought he could make a profitable artist out of it. So he flew Jumex out to LA. It didn't stop there though. Brad also got Jumex some pretty decent industry connections. For example, Jumex never wrote his songs, and instead they were written by some pretty big names in the industry. Loner was written by I Love McConan. What's funny is Jumex knew he had no talent, so he would beg people to write him songs, and if you just read them, they're pretty embarrassing. Later, a genius interview dropped, and people were clowning on him heavily, and after that, it didn't take long for fans to completely turn on Jumex. He got a ton of hate, and it was clear his career wouldn't go anywhere. He was dropped by the label and kicked to the curb. Except that wasn't the end of Jumex. So where is he now? After the fiasco of his industry planish career, he did a ton of mess up stuff that basically guaranteed he would never have a career in the music industry. However, even before he was dropped by his label, Jumex did some other questionable acts. He tried to be friends with Billie Eilish or to better describe it, pretended to be friends with Billie Eilish by posting a picture of them at a fam meetup pretending they were friends. He was also still part of a collective with his high school friends and decided to abuse the copyright system and copyright strike all of his old friends music and hacked into the old group's clothing brand on Instagram and attempted to rebrand it as his. Finally, he doxed all of those ex-friends on Snapchat and threatened to do it again. Yeah, this guy was not a great person. But Jumex wasn't done with the shenanigans. In 2020, Jumex started beefing with Lil Xan. At this point, both their careers were completely down the drain. But Lil Xan was actually someone at one point. Jumex blocked Lil Xan and Xan went on a rant writing, Lol, I put so many people onto Jumex and now he just blocked me. I was trying to help him get more exposure. I'm not going to read the rest, but he was mad. At this point, the label was totally done with Jumex and he was barred from releasing music under his name. And Jumex was left with nothing. His old friends were no longer friends because Jumex stalked him. He had no shot in the industry anymore and everyone knew he was an industry plant. Kinda sad because he probably was left with hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt. So at this point, you probably noticed a couple patterns among these artists. Jumex and Baby Goth tried to wear depression as a brand like, oh, I'm depressed, I'm mentally ill, etc. But no one who was actually depressed would do that. And most of all, they didn't really have any talent. And the one that did succeed, the Killer Roy, did. Thanks for watching.